hey, this is a future of what single. If you want to get the whole thing, visit our website at killrockstars.com slash the future of what. Today, I'm talking to Tom Wally in our Los Angeles studio. Tom, welcome to the future of what? Glad to be here. So you have a fascinating story, and I wanted to start right out by just getting you to tell us, how did you get into the music business? Well, my first job in the, in the business was in 1979, and I started in the mailroom at Warner Brothers Records. Excellent. And from there, you moved up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll try to give you the short versions of it all, but yeah. uh, I, I used that as a platform to learn, to understand mm-hmm. what the, the business was or what the company was. And I would take classes at UCLA at night that would explain more to me that I could learn in the mailroom, but I would connect it to things. So when I would deliver mail to the promotion department, I would learn what the promotion department did, you know, by talking to people, getting to know people. And I did that with every department in, in the company. And through you know a few years of doing that and i realized what i wanted to do or what i thought was appropriate for me i didn't see myself calling radio stations and convincing them to play music or going to retailers and convincing them to take music in the stores i wasn't a salesman so that's not what fit me i was pretty quiet and a bit shy. So I thought, hey, I can listen to music. <laughs> and I love listening to music. And I would go out at night and, and see bands in town. And mm-hmm. I thought, well, I should do this. So I focused on getting into the A&R department from the mailroom. Wow. And you did. And I did. You did eventually get into the A&R department. Yeah. So I would, the, the mailroom gave you access to things. <laughs> that, <laughs> um, you had as much information as you wanted to have from financial information on the company to, to anything. You, wow. guys, you got to know people, you, you made copies of things. And so if you were smart and you read them, you would learn, right? And steal anything, but I would intellectually read it and, and hold on to it in my brain. But one of the things I was able to do when I would pick up mail from one a r person to another, they would pass notes to each other of bands they would see at night. So there just happened to be a, a copy machine between one office to the other, and I would uh, make a copy for myself, and then I would go out at night and see the bands that they were looking at and make my own notes. Oh, wow. And, I, and then uh, and I would get a better feel for what what was the difference between what got signed or what didn't get signed and what the thinking or the feeling was around, and then apply my own instincts to it, to myself. I would just do that. And wow. then, so that paid off. And then one day I walked into the head of the department's office and I said, I want a job. <laughs> and, uh, she said, yes. And she walked me down the hall to an office that was filled with, at the time, demo tapes came in and cassettes. Right. And it was literally an office filled from floor to ceiling, from wall to wall, of thousands of demo tapes that were sent into the company. And she said, they're all yours. Give them a listen. Wow. And I listened to it. It took me one year and I listened to every one of them. Wow. And what happened from that listening? I think out of all of that music, at first I was like, oh, I like this, I like this, I like this, isn't this great? And then I realized, eh, it's not that great. (laughs) (laughs) Because you're so anxious to find something that the company would sign. Right. Right. So I started to edit myself quickly. Think about it, out of all of those thousands of tapes, I think one was seriously considered, but didn't get signed, but was seriously considered. And that's when I realized that was not how things were really done, that there were other ways that you found music that could be important and it wasn't coming by unsolicited demo tapes coming in the mail. Right. So what was the first band that you signed and how did you sign them? If I go back in time, I mean, today, what what young A&R people are called are scouts. You know, they're out there looking and searching. Back then, we weren't called scouts. We were we were associates of A&R. We had like a corporate title or something. And uh, But I was fundamentally a guy up there looking for things and let the, the other people make decisions about them. Hmm. So it took me a while to learn, you know, hey, I have to sign this or I want to sign this and sort of rally it. But I was good at finding things, right? So the first band I ever sort of stood up behind was Modern English. They, wow. they had a song called I Melt With You. Mm-hmm. And I was going... Wow, this it came in the mail. It was come in the mail, but it came in through through Beggar's Banquet, Martin Mills. Right. And at that time they didn't have US operations and they licensed music 
into uh, American record companies and they had a preferred relationship with Warner Brothers and the music came in and I was like, this is great, this is great. And we ended up signing it to Sire Records uh, with Seymour Stein and that record's been around forever. Yeah, and it's obviously a huge, huge record. Yeah. So how did you move from that to the head of Warner Music? What what ended up... Well, the, the the process of moving up the ranks in the record industry, I mean, it can happen in many different ways. Warner Brothers was an incredible, incredible record company, and I was extremely fortunate and lucky to have picked the right one to get to the mailroom, that uh, <laughs> their sensibility, the cultural sensibility of how they did business, that they perceive music as an art form, right? And they balanced out the business with strong support of, of that art. And that was, if I was somewhere else, there's companies who didn't understand that. They, there was more understanding of it as commerce, right? And so for me, the, that combination of art and business fit me really, really well, right? So that learning curve of an understanding that to this day is is created my philosophy on how I want the business of music to work. So from Warner Brothers, I couldn't find my way up the ranks. It, there were a lot of people sort of in front of me. And I got a call one day to, uh, from Capitol Records to go work for them. And they were tripling my salary. And I was like, Yahoo, isn't this great? <laughs> and Warner Brothers couldn't find a role for me as a, you know, to sort of move up the ranks. So I left. Right? And I went to a company that culturally was so different that it was about commerce and not mm -hmm. about art. And it was in the beginning very difficult for me. And I was like, oh my God, I made the biggest mistake of my <laughs> career. What do I do now? <laughs> right? right. So one day I just woke up and I said, you know what? I made this decision. I've got to figure this out. And this is now the time for you to stand up and be your own person, to take to make your own decisions about what you want to sign, not do it in a sense of community, which was part of how it was done at Warner Brothers, which was great. But I didn't like the tastes of the other people on Capitol Records. So I said, okay, this is my time. And that was, so what, what felt wrong to me, like I made a bad decision, I turned into one of the best decisions I made because I made myself accountable. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. And, and the first act I signed was a group called Crowded House from Australia. And um, Fabulous. it became incredibly successful. And that created a lot of belief in myself to go do it more. Right. And then things kind of took off from there. And then I became the head of, head of the A&R department at Capital from doing good things. And my boss and I at the time hit political difficulties with new senior management at corporate. And they, they fired me for signing the Beastie Boys and Bonnie Raitt. <laughs> <laughs> What a horrible mistake. <laughs> they told me Bonnie Raitt was too old. And the Beastie Boys didn't have a fight for your right to party on uh, on their album. Oh, isn't that amazing? And that album was Paul's Boutique. Right. Yeah. Fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> and Bonnie Raitt won five Grammys. Yeah. For a nick of time. Yeah. Amazing. So is that when you went back to Warner at that point? No, there's still a lot in between. Oh um, so I was sitting at home with no job and being a out of work a and our person in our business is not a good thing because people, it, our business follows heat, right? And if you lose your job, that's considered cold. Mm -hmm. And if you're cold, people don't call you. Right. So no one would return my phone calls and uh, after done a lot of great work. And Bonnie Raitt won her five Grammys for Nick of Time a few months later after they let me go. And the phone started ringing because she thanked me on the podium when she won her Grammys. Awesome. So she said, that was a nice payback. Mm -hmm. And this man, Ted Field, called, or his representative called, and he said it was a man who wanted to start a record company. And that was Interscope Records. Wow. Right. So I joined him and this other guy, John McLean, joined him and Jimmy Iovine joined him. And the four of us set out to start Interscope Records. And that was in 1990. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. And I mean, the rest of that is history Yes, to some extent. Yeah. So you were at Interscope for how long? About 10 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And John McLean and myself were the, we were they and our guys, we were the guys finding the music mm -hmm. and our simple philosophy of Interscope was to empower the music. And so you empower the people signed it and, and then everyone else was there. So it was there to service the, the music, right? Mm -hmm. So with Jimmy Iovine, Ted Field, John McLean or myself, 
wanted to you know, sign something, we were empowered to go make it happen. And there wasn't anything in between us. And it was the most lethal thing I've ever felt in terms of seeing an act in a club or hearing music and be able to act on it and provide the support for the, for that vision without any interference. Wow. Right. So it was truly an independent company, just the way Porsche you, you have with your company, where you make your own decisions and you, you, you follow up on them. Right. And that was the same thing, but we were, we were, the intention wasn't to be small or we had the resources to be as big as we wanted to right. because Ted field provided the, the money to, to do it. Right. That's amazing. Yeah. So then after you left Interscope, where did you go? Somewhere around 2000, we sold uh, Interscope and we kind of all went our separate ways. Uh, the four of us went our separate ways. So I went to Warner Brothers from there. They called and I thought, wow, this could be really cool. I was in the mailroom uh, <laughs> in the beginning and now I'm the chairman of the company. And I used to dream that when I was the, you know, to motivate myself when mm -hmm. I was pushing the mail cart around, <laughs> around the floors. So the fact that I could actually make it happen and I thought the right thing was to say yes and go do it. That's so, so that's cool. <laughs> it's a really cool trajectory. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about your A and R philosophy because I think that's one of the things that makes you. I mean, you've had so many different experiences and you've worked for so many different types of companies. And like mm -hmm. you said, you know, you've had budget constraints, you've had total freedom. Now you run your own independent label. Right. So you know, you've really done a lot, but still within that, you have this A and R philosophy. Again, going back to Warner Brothers, there was that sort of helped define what my philosophy became, although it evolves over time. And, you know, that there's, as you go through changes in the business or that, you, you, you probably adapt a bit to what your philosophies are. But I, I always thought it was important to find things that were, had some unique voice about themselves that had a point of view, as I like to call it. And that point of view can come from anything. It can come from a lyric. It can come from the music. It can come from a voice, right? And I was always a strong believer in what I call, would call a self-contained artist, an artist who writes their own songs and, and performs them. Right. So that was, that fundamentally is what I still believe in and what I, I still look for when I'm, when I'm signing a, an artist. So when you sign an artist, how free do you feel to go into the studio with them? I mean, at what point are you like, okay, this is what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. You know, how does, how does that work with you when you sign an artist? Well, I, I don't define what their record should be or the sound of the record should be. It's, it's not nothing like that. It's more guidance. I think what makes our business work is I think when, when, Real artists find greatness, right? And that's not an easy thing to, to, to do, right? And if you look at any, anything else in our world that you, that this kind of is in front of us every day, like sports, right? We revere, for many people revere the greatness of it, right? The greatest athletes. And those athletes always have coaches or personal trainers or personal advice, business people, et cetera. They get a lot of advice on how to become great or stay great. And, it's the same sensibility that I pr can provide guidance on, on where that, you know, how to help someone get to that point, help an artist get to that point, right? So it's not interference, which some people define, are afraid of. That's, uh, you know, someone who can, comes into the studio or someone who talks about my music is going to interfere and compromise who I am or what I am. And that's not it at all, although that does happen. It's sure. not, it doesn't, yeah. it's not the philosophy that I bring into the room. When I sign someone, there has to be a shared vision and some insight into what they're doing that you believe in and that you can support. And when you have that, it's always been easy for me to, to be able to help them in, in, in the process of making records and achieving what hopefully is greatness, right? So, and that could be anything from a mix uh, to... I know, do they have all the right songs on a record to a vocal performance? Or it could be no advice whatsoever. It's just, this, you did it. It's fantastic, right? So having that ability can make a big difference on what the, what the outcome is. And there are producers and songwriters and musicians that also do that probably better than I do in a certain way. But I'm not a record producer. I'm not a musician. But there's, I have an ability to hear things. Putting people together, is that something that you also do? 
Not so much from a songwriting standpoint, although I do some of that today. That's very prevalent in today's world where mm-hmm. there, if you looked at the Grammys the other night, some of the song categories, the song of the year categories, there were 20 writers on a song, right? right? So that idea of providing writing help for an artist is very prevalent, particularly in pop music. But in the self-contained artists, it's not something that is traditionally done, although Bob Dylan did it. (laughs) And many of the people in the 60s who were known as great songwriters, if you go and check the credits, collaboration was not a a taboo. It was part of what people like to do was to their friend down the street, they wanted to go write songs with them, right? right? So, you know, in today's world, that has become certainly an independent musician music. It's like been the taboo of, of writing or collaborating with producers or and that kind of thing. I think, quite frankly, I think that's a, that's a mistake. I think that it takes input, like I said, to achieve great things, right? And if you can learn from someone else to evolve your craft and evolve your knowledge around that craft... That's a that's a very good thing. Whereas if you shut it down, there's only so much any one person can know, right? right. Or any band can know, that's true. right? It, new knowledge is is helps you keep going, right? right? And I think that's the the mistake. If you know who you are and what you are and what your soul is and what makes your music different or than everybody else, it's impossible for someone else to to take that away from you. Right? right. So, but if they can provide knowledge that helps you become a better songwriter or a better guitar player or a better singer or how to make your voice sound better on a record or the process of making records becomes a better thing for you, then why not? Right. Right. I think we have a little bit of a cultural problem in our world with this idea of pure genius, you know, that someone just is born with some kind of talent and that it doesn't need any kind of nurturing or practice or encouragement or input, that they just are this like perfect flower that's going to grow and bloom. I mean, I really think that that's kind of an issue for us because I feel like you see it in, in all walks of life. So sports figures, movie stars, you know, you don't see any of the hours, hundreds and thousands of hours of practice that it took to get them there. You don't see the acting classes. You don't see the you know waiting tables for the actresses and the actors, you know, but there they are on your screen at home and you think, oh, someone just saw their genius and put them up there, you know, and I think that's a real problem for the music industry. Uh, absolutely. I th- there, there's a false sense of success that I think exists from the YouTube world or the, what I call the do it yourself world, where you can make a record in your bedroom today, right? And, and put a video up on YouTube and you can get in a van and all of a sudden you're successful, right? Mm-hmm. And that's, that's all fine. It's, I think it's all helpful in the process. The, the beginning process for, for an artist decades ago was they, you know, they had to hone their craft in their garage or their bedroom. They had to spend hours and hours and hours playing their guitar or their instrument and then figure out how to find another guy who wants to play an instrument and put together a band in, the, you know, in their parents' house or their garage or whatever. Then from there, you got to find a club to let yourself play in you know, and get yourself to play in. You have to write a song that the people on the other side like, right? And you had to create a demo of that song somewhere. And there was a harder process to get there. And from that, it was a natural editing process of who was good or who wasn't, right? And it's easier today to get out of the gate, which I think is all good. Right. right, but I do think it's interfering with great musicians making great music and sustaining it. Right, the sustaining, sustaining part is what's it, yeah. difficult, mm-hmm. and I think that comes can be an easier process when there's knowledge that that you're learning from somebody else, mm-hmm. and that happens in place at sports or any profession. There's mentorship, and we've in the indie. Like rock world or any musician world, I think there's been a wall put up about that, and I think that's that's a mistake. Mm-hmm. And if you look in pop music, where there's constant innovation, they're constantly looking for new sounds, and they cannot; those artists cannot survive and sustain unless they have the best one of the best five songs in the in the world at any given time. Right. And if you're not in the top five, you don't have a career, right? Right. right. So the competition to be the best, find the best, whether you like pop music or not, that that comp- competitive sensibility from producers, writers, and artists is what why pop music is is dominating right now. 
and less so on the musician world because it's there's this less of interest of of what feels like what it takes to innovate there's innovation inside of what i already know Mm -hmm. but there's not innovation by inviting maybe more knowledgeable people in the room to help you get to a place that maybe is the unknown when that's where greatness happens is the unknown right right good point so a few years ago you started your own independent record label loma vista and how is that for you i mean coming from the major label world that you were in for so long how does it feel to be an independent now (laughs) <laughs> well, I, I I have felt independent for a very long time. I think since we started Interscope, that was my first sense of what independence was. And we were an independent. Mm-hmm. It's, it's just, it's, to some people didn't feel that way because we became big, but mm-hmm. we were truly independent. We owned the company, right? The self-finance, self-owned. The is, yeah. <laughs> we owned it. It just became big. And then when it sold to a, to a big company, corporation, then clearly it wasn't anymore. But I had that feeling. That's where I learned what that really meant, right? And Mm -hmm. so, as I said before, it's that that sense of empowering the music and trying to have clear vision and support of that vision around it. I've never, I haven't lost that since I learned what it was, really, when I Mm -hmm. truly learned what it was. And I brought that to Warner Brothers too. But where it clashed is when my corporate bosses didn't understand it, right? So it was better to get out than to yeah. <laughs> than to stay in it and and argue about it all the time. But the fun of of creating Loma Vista is that I, I'm doing it again. It's just smaller and and doing it in a in a, a, a different way in terms of I I is going to take a slower approach to build to build the company than was at Interscope because we came in with a big force in mind where this is intended to be something a little more moderate in its early sensibilities. Okay. But but the empowerment of music, the freedom of creativity, the supportive creativity, that sensibility is still intact. Cool. Do you have any stories from any part of your career where you were really backing a band and you had opposition and then it just really worked out well? <laughs> There's lots of those. I want to hear them. <laughs> I love lots those, of those stories. Well, the Beastie Boys story was was interesting because yeah. I was the head of A and R. We were trying to I was trying to build this really cool roster. We had signed Skinny Puppy and and who they thought I was out of my mind <laughs> for. And I was trying to Capitol Records at the time was known for hair bands, right? Which mm-hmm. again had nothing wrong with it and heavy metal bands and stuff like that. I was just trying to add to the, to the sensibility. So when Paul's Boutique showed up and it wasn't a pop record like like fight your right to party, it confused everybody. And that's, it cost me my job, right? Mm-hmm. But clearly the end result was there that it's, I don't know what it sold at this point, but it's many, many millions. Yes. And is a classic record that yeah. has meant a lot to many, many people. And I think was a force in the change of music. So Absolutely. that was one that went from, what are you talking about? To something that was very, very <laughs> successful. To, oh, we were wrong. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Vonnie Ray, the same thing. Yeah. Tupac Shakur, you know, no one told me I was wrong, so to speak, but it was... Well, actually, there was a little bit of someone telling me I was wrong. But we, at that time at Interscope, we were attached to, for services, we were attached to a bigger company. And I won't mention names here, but we were were attached to one of the divisions of Atlantic Records. And I brought the first Tupac album into New York to play for them to to get their support. And they all told me I didn't know what I was talking about. And uh, this record was terrible. And what do I know about rap music, which I didn't know anything. I just saw an artist that I liked, and I liked that he had something to say. And I thought for building a roster, I think this guy's great. So I came back to, to uh, Ted Field and Jimmy Ivey and I said, what do we do now? I said, I, they don't have their support. I, what do I do? And they said, well, you're a smart guy. You'll figure it out. <laughs> and uh, Ted said, here's your money. Go figure it out. And I went with the manager. We built our own team around the record and went out and sold a half a million albums. And then the rest is history. Yeah, seriously. Yeah, so that went from, this stinks to uh, history. I mean, being an A&R person is a really interesting job because there's a clear talent, right? I mean, some people just have that talent and that talent is to, to sniff the zeitgeist, right? To like really be able to say, not only is this a great artist, but this is a great artist that people are going to love, Yes, which is kind of nuts, right? To have that talent. But then of course, there's also just a ton of work involved in finding the artist's digging, you know, li- knowing, knowing when to stop listening to the negative self-talk. I mean, there must be a lot, you know, of times when you've thought to yourself, maybe I'm wrong, or do you never think that? 
Of course, I did. I always, <laughs> I always had enough self doubt in me to work harder. <laughs> so you're not right all the time. It's, it's not possible. Things change too, right? Sometimes you'll you'll sign an artist, and one of the band members will drop out. Right? Well, right, and some things like that happen, right? And sometimes you're just wrong. You thought you were so excited and the public really didn't care and it wasn't as good as you thought it was, right? Mm-hmm. Something changes, right? Or, 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 but you're, if you're not committed to your, to your beliefs, and the, I always wanted to live up to the promises I made to the artists, right? And because they, they're committing to you, right? Uh, that they have to sign a contract with you and it lasts for many, many years, right? right. And, if you can't live up to your promises, then you shouldn't be in the job of A&R, right? right? And that was, again, that empowerment thing that I, I got from Interscope, where I could live up to my promises. I wasn't always right, but I would never let an artist down by not living up to what we talked about or what I said I would do, right? If something changed, I'd say, this is this is something's changed here, so let's go do it this way, right? And I I was willing to take it as far as humanly possible to find out whether the artist and I were right or we were wrong, right? And where did we were we doing something that people were going to like? And I, I still believe in that, right? Mm-hmm. And today is different, though. A lot of A&R is done through research. Mm. Mm. Tell, tell us about that. I don't do it, so I don't. I don't know. I know what people do, but there's enough information out there where you can collect YouTube views. You can people who are making music in their bedroom can put it out on their own, right? And then you can pick up that information through data, right? And and reading what is a hit in Australia on some little company or in some part of the world, and you can pick up that information and run it through a computer, and they can tell you whether people like it or not, and you can oh. sign artists just based on that. Right. And I don't have a facility to do it. It works. People do it every day. And a lot. So I think the instinctual sensibility of and the ability to understand the talent and what makes it work. What's the heartbeat of this artist that's going to make a music fan like them? Right. And how do you expose that to them to get them to understand who they are? Right. And that takes years to do that sometimes. Right. And most of the time. But when it's about the immediacy of it, then it's easier just to have a computer tell you what to do and have research tell you what to do and make a phone call and say, hey, I I did all this research on you on YouTube and I want to sign you. And they never met them. And they put a contract in front of them just because the research tells them to do it. Right. So that happens. Every, every every day, wow! Every day, but I don't do it that way. I I don't know how to how to do that because <laughs> when you get to the reality of sustaining, I'm in, I'm interested in in an artist's career lasting. Right. I'm not into just hey, you had a one off song or one off album, right? And I still believe in the album as an art form, mm-hmm. and that's a difficult thing to achieve in today's world to make a body of work that's great from beginning to end and then mm. get someone to buy in, right. right? Whether they stream it or buy it or, or whether they buy a concert ticket or a t-shirt or bundles of it or whatever it is. It, it, the art form of an album is to get people to buy into a holistic view that this artist has something to say and they stand for something. Right. 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 A computer can't tell you that. No. It's impossible. Yeah. And I fear that doing it that way, doing it by the numbers, you're going to end up with one album artists or one single artist. Yeah, because that you don't know why you signed them. Mm-hmm. You're just doing it because it's commerce. And if it's commerce, then that comes and goes, right? And that's one way to do it. There's, it's you know, different record companies represent different things, and there's lots of record companies out there, from the littlest ones to the biggest ones, right? And artists have their choices of who they want to work with or do it themselves, right? Mm-hmm. But I, I find in order to sustain a career and, and help someone have potentially a 30-year career or longer or whatever it is, that to understand what makes them unique creatively is really what's going to gonna make it work because then you build culture, right? And it's right. not just the music that creates the culture. It's the artwork, it's the photographs, it's how you approach the marketplace. What's, if, if someone wants to use their song in a movie, is it the right movie or the wrong movie for this artist? There's a lot of decisions that go into building a career that, and you can't do it unless you're, you understand this sense of culture and what makes this artist unique versus somebody else. And on that note, Tom Wally runs Loma Vista records, and we are so happy to have you in the studio today. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Did you like what you heard? 
then subscribe to The Future of What on iTunes. And thanks for listening.